man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Now notice he said, let us make man, but let them have dominion over the face of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. You may be seated. I want to preach this morning on the mailman. Hallelujah. The mailman. How many appreciates the mailman? Yeah, Kathy's back there. and <laughs> Well, you're a male woman, so... Uh, but she's spelling it M-A-I-L, but I'm spelling it as the Bible does, M-A-L-E, the mailman. It's very clear that in this first chapter here, when the creation as account is given to us, that the word man initially is a very generic term that referred to both a male man and a female man, which means of the dust. And since this is Father's Day and our focus is upon you dads and you dudes, I guess, that's what was on our card, uh, we, we want to talk about the male man then. And as I was thinking about creation and an exemplary uh, illustration of a male man, a male figure of what God would want every one of us male men to be. I, obviously, there's Jesus that came, but in the essence of where he was 100% man, he was also 100% God. So as far as an individual that was 100% humanity, uh, in and of uh, and in this world, I don't think that you're going to find a better example of the fellowship that God desired to have with the male men than what he had with Adam prior to the fall, prior to sin being introduced into this old world, prior to Adam uh, being marred and being stained by sin and wreaking havoc and bringing down upon all of creation. So if, if you and I want to see that kind of relationship, let's go back and let's review the mailman and see what kind of relationship he had even before the fall. And what you and I can take solace in and that we can... Uh, thank God for is you see that which Adam lost because of his sin, Jesus Christ has reclaimed for us today. So what Adam had, you and I can have as well that kind of a relationship. So what I want to do is go through chapters 1 and 2 and even a part of three, and I want us to pull out some of these principles and relate them to us, male men, and see how our relationship with God stacks up and what the Lord desires that we should be. The first thing that I want to draw to your attention, and I do this especially for the women here with us, uh, dudes, is that in the scriptures, the Bible talks about, and here's the word I'll use, the wonder of the male man. And not one of the sisters said amen. They're just looking at me. The male man is wonderful. Thank you, Brother Mike. <laughs> 
the mailman is wonderful. Uh, you, you gals, you wonder at us all the time. See, now I'll get some amens on that one. That's more like it, huh? According to the scripture, the word, uh, you know, may not be used in that sense, but, uh, but really this applies to the woman as well. But what I want to bring out is in our text here, David on one occasion, he said this, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He's referring to uh, this physical life and how God has so put us together and the magnificent abilities of the members of the body and what they do for the whole of the body and really for us now that living in this technological age and medical science has prospered to such a degree and we know so much more than even what David did hundreds of years ago. We too can say with even a greater authority, we truly are fearfully and wonderfully made. But you see, the greatest wonder about the mailman is not his physical creation. But here in our text, the greatest wonder about him is that he is made in the image of God. Wow, that can mean a lot of things of which certainly maybe some of the physical attributes and abilities we have does give indication to the power of God and how God is. You see, whereas, guys, we are able to see and hear and know and do some things God is able to see and know and hear and do all things. But the greatest manner in which we are made, and some of them deeper than even that in the image of God, is God has given us a moral conscience. God has given us a volition and a will. We are not like the rest of creatures upon this earth. We are driven by instinct. But he has given us a mind to be able to reason and function and to be able to solve problems and look at the situation and do some figuring and bring out a conclusion. We are able to communicate with great significance and in great detail. And because of all of that, we're made in the image of God. But here let me say that the main reason of our wonder and being in the image of God is because God has placed a spirit in us unlike the rest of creation. We are body, soul, and spirit. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Do you realize that without that spirit made in the image of God, we could never know God, we could never commune with God, we could never know the joys of his presence and his hand upon our life and embracing us and taking us in. We would never be able to know that. But because he has made us, in his image, created us in his likeness, we have a spirit and we can commune with God. So let me just ask you guys and men and dads uh, here this morning uh, that, that we are made in the image of God. How is the image of God shining through your life today? In every one of our relationships, in everything that we do and say and are, is Jesus Christ and Almighty God shining forth in us? If not, that's what the Lord desires. He truly wants us reflecting His image. Not only do I see here the wonder of man, but uh, the male man, but I see the weight of the male man. No, I'm not going to ask you guys how much you weigh. 
I wouldn't do that to you nor to me. But when I talk about the weight, I'm talking about his influence. I'm talking about his authority. I'm talking about, you know, we refer to individuals and we may say, boy, they carry a lot of weight around here. We're not talking about their physical weight. We're talking about the influence, the authority that they have. And in the passage that we read, Genesis 1, 26, the Bible makes it very clear that as far as the weight that the male man is to carry, he is to have dominion over the earth. Come on, church. We have that dominion. And that dominion as it speaks here, this weight of over every living thing and over the entirety of the earth, part of that domination has come because of how God has made us in his image and because of the mind that he has given us and because, you see, there are a lot of animals, fellow creatures, upon this old earth that we share this lonely abode with sometimes that are far bigger and faster and ferocious than what we are. But the reason that we have the dominance is because of our minds. We have invented things and we understand them and, and we have equalizers that brings about a domination of which God has clearly intended that man is to have. Now, I'm not talking about a supremacy, a thumbs down, and a destruction, obviously not, but to keep and to toil and to preserve and to help. But, but here's the thing, that, that God has given us this domination, but also in the spiritual sense, that that which Adam lost, we have been given back and over the domination. And you know what the great thing? The Lord said, I'll not just give you domination over the world now as far as the weight of the male man. But he said, now that sin has been introduced and now that there is a devil that is in opposition to you, I give you power and authority over him as well. Authority. Weight. Who carries the weight around here? Not the devil. It's the male men. It's the brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, brethren, let me ask you in each one of your positions of whether it be on the job or whether it be in the home or whether it be in the community, it does not matter how are you exercising and exerting that authority and that influence. Are you using that weight, if you will, uh, as, a, as a tool and as a means of good and of bringing people to the Lord Jesus Christ? So male men, let me ask you, how are we utilizing that authority that God has given us? I also want us to look at the worship of the male man. Now this is actually found in the third chapter is where sin is introduced and where Adam and Eve had sinned. But it's there in verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And of course they were hiding after they had sinned from the Lord. And the Lord says, Where are you? And he didn't ask because he did not know their location, but he was simply asking to drive the home, uh, the point home in their lives of where they had fallen from. Many, many principles in this situation here. But what I want us to focus upon is that reference there that God came to them in the garden walking in the cool of the day. The way this is written originally, he is not letting us know that this is a unique situation here simply because of the fall. What I'm saying by that is that 
this is not the first time God had come walking in the cool of the day to commune and to fellowship with Adam and Eve. The way that it is written that this was a regular, this was a normal, this was a daily activity in the cool of the day that was set aside where God would come in and fellowship uh, with the mailman and the uh, and and his wife and 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 the female and and they would also commune with God and so yeah let me simply run and drive the point home and ask us guys do you and I have Regular time set aside on a daily basis that we're going to seek out communion and fellowship with God. And we're going to allow the Lord to come in and fellowship with us. Or does it just kind of happen sporadically and whenever we get the time or when opportunity avails itself But you see, on a daily, on a regular basis, we need this worship, this fellowship with Almighty God. And let me say, guys, that you are the spiritual leaders of your family. You are the high priests, as it were, of your family. And so you're the one that needs to set the example of times of in the word of God, times of prayer, gathering your family together as a whole into the house of the Lord and saying that on a regular basis... We are going to commune and fellowship and worship God. Ah, there's a lot more because you see the mailman is just so wonderful. Boy, this is a tough crowd this morning. I don't know if you guys are tired or what, but man, this is tough. I'm trying to make it a little light as well as serious, but... All I see is those eyebrows down again, and you're kind of scaring me. So maybe we'll do it like this. The next thing I want us to see is the wisdom of the mailman. Do you understand that they tell us that we only use such a small proportion of our knowledge and our brain capacity? And to see how excellent man's, the mailman's wisdom and his knowledge and his mind capacity was before sin came in and tainted, The Bible tells us going back to chapter 2 and verse 19 and 20, and this was even before he had a wife. So this was really a great accomplishment. God brought all of the animals to him and said, Adam, I want you to name them. Now, you know what? I can't even name all of the animals, let alone name them initially. Now, come on, folks, think about that. To be able to give an intelligent name to all of the animals, to do it quickly, to do it as he looks over them and and gives them a name. Here's the real awesomeness and the awe-inspiring part of this story. It's not just that he was able to name them, but he was able to remember what he named them after he had named them. You see, I might be able, you may show me something and really nothing just blotches and say, I want you to give names to these blotches on a piece of paper. And I could just randomly come up with some kind of goofy name, but by the time I got to the 6-1, you would say, okay, Pull up the first one. Now, what did you name this one, the first one? Uh, What was the second one? What did you call this? And so even after Adam was finished, he didn't go back to the first one and look at it and say, "Mm, what is that? Uh, Elephant. No, 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 no. Uh, 
hippopotamus, no rhinoceros. No, no. Why did I name them such big names? Oh, okay, cat. Dog, no, that's not it either. What's the one with the long neck and kind of uh, spots and irregular on them? Oh, yeah, giraffe. He was able to remember. And what knowledge that was. The Bible tells us, guys, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, wisdom, understanding. That wonderful favorite book of Brother Shelby's, the Proverbs, tells us not to lean on our own understanding, but to lean upon Him. And that's truly, wisdom really does, genuine wisdom truly does come from fearing the Lord, having a high regard and respect for who God is and what God is able to do and then recognizing after who he is, he has a right and he has the know-how of telling me how I can generate the best out of my life and he has done so by recording in the word of God and so me exercising the greatest of wisdom is that I will simply live and follow what he has given to me in thus saith the Lord. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom of the mailman. The work of the mailman. Do you realize that work is not a consequence of sin? Now, I know on Monday mornings when you have to roll out of bed, you probably think it is, I don't want to. Or maybe it's in the middle of the night you roll out or whenever your shift is. I don't want to go to work. But work is good and was good before the fall. It's the sweating of the brow. It's the working and working yourself to death and not being able to show anything for it. That's where the real work comes in because of sin. These noxious weeds that grow and try to have a garden. And, you know, you want beautiful flowers just to grow out there on the green grass by themselves. But they don't. The weeds grow up around them. And you have to labor and work to try to keep them out of there. So you see, God understood, and even when he put the mailman in this wonderful place, the Garden of Eden, he had a job for him to do, going back to chapter 2 and verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. God understood that work and activity is not a curse to man, but he knew that, that activity and labor was very healthy for the total well-being of mankind. If, if, you, if individuals don't have anything to do and they don't have any fellowship and some of the other things we've talked about, it is a very boring, hapless life of which individuals do not want to live. God wants us to be active. God wants us to be, to be moving. But you see, sin is the one that spoiled us. Can you folks that enjoy working in the garden or working in the flower garden or whatever it is that you do, can you imagine that you say, well, if there was no sin, no weeds, none of this, why did he have to dress it? Because he wanted them to notice. He wanted them to learn from it. And here's the way that I see it. Can you imagine have a bounty crop every year, but it only gets better and better as you understand how to work it, how to keep it, how to till it. It only gets better and better and better. Wouldn't that be exciting just to see what you could do, how big a tomato you could grow? Man, the Bible says that even after, even after some years in Canaan when they went into there, they found grapes and some other things that were so huge and so large 
is only that. Only God can. So the work of man. Guys, do you have a good work ethic? Are you teaching your children a good work ethic? You see, the measure of a man is not measured by what he does, but it's how he does it. So don't feel bad or embarrassed by what you do. If you do it well and as unto the Lord, that is the real measure of a man. The last thing, and I'm glad this is about over. The wonder, the weight, the worship, the wisdom, the work of the mailman. But I want to talk about the woman of the mailman. Thank you, sisters. At least I know somebody's alive and well. <laughs> the woman. I started to put the wife, but, you know, since I didn't know that our cards from Walmart that we gave out were going to have dude on them. So, you know, dude, the woman, the woman. The Bible says in the last few verses of chapter 2 of where he created woman out of the side, the rib of Adam, and brought them together. And the reason he wanted them, Adam to name is he wanted Adam to get a very in-depth understanding that he did not have what the animals had, a counterpart, a helpmeet, was just like him but very different from him. And that's the mystery and that's the beauty of it. Just like me, but so different from me. And God brings the woman to man and actually, I believe, performs the first wedding. And here in the last couple of verses, we have the first definition, the first declaration, demonstration of marriage. And he says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And I'll just stop there. But did you notice, guys, that in the first declaration of this union that was ordained of God called holy matrimony wedlock, he says nothing to the woman, but he addresses the man. Now, you women ought to be shouting now. He said, and the man shall leave his mother and father. And it's the man that shall cleave to his wife. We live in such a day where men are deserting their families at such a high rate. Men, we're better than that. God created a male man. A male man. And he wants that male man to love his wife, treat her with dignity and respect. He's the one that's going to set the atmosphere of I will leave everything else. I will leave my hobbies. I'll leave my best buds before I got saved and spend more time with my wife. I'll leave, and you know what I'm talking, not quitting your job, but you're not going to live your job. There's a new responsibility now that you're going to cleave to. And if you don't want that responsibility, then don't get married. That's what Paul says. 
That does not leave the women, but this is Father's Day. I'm talking to the men, and my wife talks on Mother's Day, so I have to tell her to get rough on the ladies next time around. There are duties and responsibilities for the ladies and the wives, but here he said, it's the man. And there's reasons for that, but for the sake of today, and my time is running out, I just want to challenge all of us guys. Take a look at how it was before sin came in and tainted all of this mess. And we can have that yet again with Christ. But how does our lives really measure up with the mailman? The wonder. God's image, the weight, dominion over, the worship. Regular set aside times to meet with God. Wisdom to use it for the Lord and his kingdom, the work, have a good work ethic and also in the kingdom of God and then treat our wives, our women with chivalry, with respect, with honor. Father, I thank you today for your blessings. And Lord, I pray that you will challenge each and every one of us because in essence, although I've spoken to to us guys, it's a message for everyone. That Lord, what has been lost has been regained and even more through Jesus Christ. So God, I want to take inventory of my life and my relationships and see how they are and what they are and how they stack up with the mailman before sin tainted all of this and God challenged me to what you want me to be. And Lord, I pray that you will minister and you will bless and God, I'll give you praise for it.